This is the Yosemite toad, and uh, this is my master's research. Um, it's a beautiful animal that occurs in high elevations along the crest of the Sierra, mainly. Um, it's most notably for its sexual dichromism, the differences between male and female coloration patterns. Uh, occurs mostly right along the ridge of the high Sierra. You can see the county lines sort of mark the distribution for the toad. And this is just sort of, sort of a cartoon to give you an idea what a typical summer is like for the Yosemite toad. Um, hopefully I can feather this wheel. As snow melts, water ponds or ponds will begin to fill up both ephemeral and permanent. And Yosemite toads will breed both in the uh, ephemeral areas and along the shorelines of lakes. And <clears throat> during drought years, the ephemeral bodies are likely to dry up as you saw in uh, Krishna's talk. This is also likely a factor for Yosemite toads making permanent water bodies that support fish uh, more critical habitat. The, it is a federal candidate species, uh, along with the mountain yellow-legged frog. It was found to be warranted but precluded due to other high-priority listings. California state species of special concern. It's, the toads believed to have experienced a 50% decline in recent times. Um, and these are all the things that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, all the malentities that they identified. Um, I chose trout stocking for my master's research because it seemed to be the most feasible that I could do in a two-year study. And, in, and also not to forget the synergistic effects of any of these acting in concert, contributing toward decline. As you know, the uh, Sierra is historically fishless above 6,000 feet, mostly due to the cascades and waterfalls. This is a pack train going in. Um, this is the actual container that they brought the fish in. And ironically, I used to take my fish out <laughs> of the back country. Um, later, when planes were introduced to drop fish into these lakes, much more efficient, uh, lots more fish going into the high country um, using this method. And you might ask, why choose brook trout and not look at golden trout, brown trout? and rainbow trout, and it's because there's my own field observations and other researchers such as Roland Knapp and Dave Martin with brook trout in, in Yosemite toad habitat in both permanent and ephemeral water bodies. Brook trout can penetrate ephemeral water bodies and at least maybe not persist, but still have um, potential negative effects. They're most persistent where trout stocking has ceased, such as Yosemite National Park, um, very cold and warm tolerant. They, their name actually means little salmon that breeds in spring, so they're really well adapted to breeding in lakes without inlets or outlets. Um, and they're also fall spawners, so they're not feeding while Yosemite toads are breeding, so that they could see Yosemite toads as a food source during the early season after a long winter. And brook trout are present in 50% of Yosemite toad habitat, and that comes from uh, Roland Knapp's data showing the elevational range with brook trout being the most predominant species. This is the brook trout. If, if people have seen this fish, they, they've probably heard it characterized as like a snake fish, has a very large head, short, tapered body. This one's probably only about 250 millimeters, very small, commonly under, under 30 centimeters. And I'm going to jump right into my palatability trial. So I looked at two aspects. I both wanted to know, are Yosemite toads at different life stages palatable to brook trout? And if they are, or if they're at least sampled by brook trout, do Yosemite toads have an anti-predator response ability to perceive trout as a potential threat? <clears throat> this is my operation at the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory at Snarl near Mammoth Lakes. Um, this is the old Hot Creek hatchery, which I've put Tupperware in, um, showing the trout inside each one. There's dividers so that trout can't observe each other. Each white container shows where Yosemite toads have been offered to the trout. Trout were starved for at least a minimum of 36 hours and up to about 16 days, 384 hours. I looked at eggs, mid, early and mid-stage tadpoles, and recently, metamorph um, recently metamorphosed tadpoles. And I included this photo because it does show some damaged eggs, so I at least knew that I had some sampling by trout, even though I did not have any, um, what is it, 380 species, or specimens, none were consumed, but I did see some damage, although this number was really low and only in the eggs, and I think only one tadpole, maybe one metamorph, had incurred injury but did not succumb to death after my 48-hour monitoring post-experiment. Let's get to the fun stuff. Oh, no. <laughs> Let me go back. Go there. I think I got it. I'm feathering the control. So at the end of my experiments, I would offer control trout, Pacific tree frogs, and this is, just an, this is just to show you that trout were willing to eat in captivity, um, I, I think quite voraciously. I ran my experiments for a minimum of eight hours and a maximum of 24, in some instances 48 hours. And you can see um, this trout consumes all 10 tree frog tadpoles in about 10 seconds. They're hungry. Okay, the next one is 
Yeah, I think I'll let you guys walk me through this one. The next one is going to be, um, I decided, well, they're at least willing to consume in a captive environment, so I decided to do choice experiments offering both tree frogs and Yosemite toad tadpoles. The first one that was consumed was a tree frog, and then the subsequent um, sampling was a Yosemite toad tadpole that was rejected twice. And without any apparent, any apparent ill effect, I didn't, see, I didn't witness any ill effects, again, 48 hours post-experiment. And the third one is, <laughs> they're pretty tough tadpoles. The tree frogs, as you'll see, were not so lucky. The next. And this is a metamorph experiment, again, um, using brook trout. And I couldn't use tree frog metamorphs because they're smart enough to climb out of the tanks. So I used <laughs> late stage, <laughs> late stage tadpoles. And again, the trout is sampling the toad. The toad looks like he kind of went into a shock for a minute, but after a minute, which is not in this video, it did come back to life and um, made it successfully. So the results of my choice experiments showed that um, Yosemite toads that were sampled uh, a total of 240 times by 10 different trout were, were rejected 100% of the time, whereas tree frogs, 72 that were consumed, 49 were eaten, and about 23 were rejected. But I do want to point out that the 23 rejected were sampled, rejected, and eviscerated, laying on the bottom. I don't know if the trout actually consumed some of them, but they were rejected. Um, so it, probably, it, do, it does um, show that there's 100% mortality in that column. So palatability, in a relative sense, there are native predators on Yosemite toads. Um, this is a predaceous diving beetle consuming a, a tree frog tadpole. But I also did choice experiments with predaceous diving beetles, and I found that, um, you know, just quickly looking at this graph, that Pacific tree frogs are more palatable to even predaceous diving beetles, at least the adults. Um, larvae of the uh, predaceous diving beetles might get around that by piercing the skin. And I just wanted to note that in the 10 beetles, um, there was only four beetles, each that ate one Yosemite toad tadpole. It was the first tadpole they consumed, and they did not eat any more after that. So I don't think they liked them either. I'll skip that. That was just an extra slide. Moving on to the anti-predator experiments. So now that I knew that Yosemite toads were at least being sampled by trout, it still could have some um, harmful effects in development time and other stressors that may prolong metamorphosis or offset metamorphosis. So I really wanted to see if they had a mechanism to detect a non-native predator. So outside of the fish house at Snarl, I set up this gravitational flow-through system that the, a couple members, Petranka and Andy C. out of the Blastein Lab, I think, designed, and Vance Friedenberg helped me with this. And this is a reservoir that flows into a stimulus tank. You put a trout or other predator in here, one empty to act as a control, and then there's a tadpole arena at the bottom. And this is just looking down. In the tadpole arena, I kind of had an imaginary dotted line that I would put an opaque plate that the tadpoles had a place to hide. Everything was randomized, including the group that got the trout, where the trout went, and where the plates were placed so that water flow into the containers didn't actually affect the movement. Um, they ran about 20 minutes. Trout were allowed to acclimate about 20 minutes. Um, flow was initiated about a half liter a minute, and Yosemite toes are allowed to acclimate for 10 minutes before I started my data collection. And I looked at both experienced and naive Yosemite toad tadpoles. And by experienced, I mean that they're in the same water body with trout in which I collected them. And naive tadpoles, meaning that there is no trout or no historical records of trout being in that area. So for experience with Yosemite toad tadpoles, I did not exhibit a statistically significant difference. Um, this is the mean activity. This is the number of crossings in that arena that was going on. On the left is the trout stimulus, and on the right is the control. And likewise, for the naive Yosemite tadpoles that have never seen brook trout, they also did not exhibit a statistically significant response to trout chemical cues. So I wasn't really sure if this was just because they have no association with them or if this just follows general behavior rules that if they are not a threat, then they shouldn't really have a need to perceive them or change or modify their behavior. So I decided to look, in a relative sense, I decided to look, since I knew tree frogs were palatable, I would test tree frogs' ability. And these were naive tree frogs that had not seen brook trout. And when I exposed them to chemical cues, there was a really big drop in the amount of movement in tadpoles exposed to trout chemical cues. So I did get a statistic, um, statistically significant result from that. I had originally planned to feed trout Yosemite toad tadpoles, because if they weren't responding to trout chemical cues, I thought they might respond to um, conspecific cues of effluent from the trout. But since that didn't work out, I used the control trout, fed them a little bit more tadpoles, tree frog tadpoles for a couple days, put them in the containers, and then exposed that to Yosemite toad tadpoles. But again, I did not see a, uh, a significant result from that experiment either. Sorry, I'm moving pretty fast, but I'd like to get the questions. So, um, I threw in a couple diving beetles since I had them just to see if Yosemite toads would respond to a native predator. 
Um, I had to cut these experiments short because there was just so much movement in the tanks that I couldn't measure it accurately, accurately without video equipment. So there's still room to, for people to test that scenario. Um, and then likewise with garter snakes, Amy Lind and I have, have observed garter snakes preying upon um, tadpoles, metamorphosing toads, and attacking adult toads. Um, not sure if they eat eggs, but probably might not. And these are a couple of Yosemite toads in their belly, <laughs> a photo taken by one of our assistants last summer. And I did not notice a statistically significant result in, in response to a native predator, such as the western terrestrial garter snake, and it sort of shocked me at first. Um, I really expected that there would be a response elicited by the toads, but in this graph there is a high level of variation, so there was a lot of movement and there was a lot of individual variation among treatments. And the stage tadpole that I used was about 36 to stage 40, and there's some evidence in the literature that tadpoles might switch to more visual cues as they're coming out on land as chemical cues are no longer helpful. So it might help to, re to duplicate these experiments using a slightly younger um, tadpole. And just for my own kicks, I started to think that anti-predator behavior, after all the literature I read, I was unhappy that they always fed their stimulus predator their, prey, or their specimen that they were testing. So I simply just used macerated ground up Yosemite toad tadpoles, deceased Yosemite toad tadpoles, and exposed them, um, exposed tadpoles to that. And I did notice that they, there was, again, so much movement that I couldn't monitor it accurately. So I do believe that they are responding to that, that stimulus. Uh, skip that. And this is just a quick, quick summary of the anti-predator experiments, total of eight experiments, egg, tadpole, and metamorph, and this is just the relationship with the trout, the stage, and I'll just let you look through it if there's something you're interested in, the uh, hours that the trout were starved, mean lengths, and then the duration of the experiments, and I can talk more about that if people are interested. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, so the conclusions from my experiment are that Yosemite toads are not palatable to brook trout. The Yosemite toads are not even injured after they are sampled by brook trout. And in, I don't know if I mentioned it, but in, did I mention that there was, in one instance, five Yosemite toad tadpoles were sampled over 125 times during one of my test experiments. So they're pretty tough. Um, they did not exhibit anti-predator behavior in response to brook trout chemical cues, and it's not you know, exactly clear why if it's... Um, if it's due to the lack of the shared history or not, or it's just because that they don't need to because they're not a prey source for trout. And future research might be um, interesting for somebody that they might only respond to injured conspecific chemical cues, and this might hold true for other amphibians as well. It's certainly suggestive. And next. Thanks. So now at least we have a baseline relationship for, the, for Yosemite toads and introduced trout in the Sierra Nevada. And this information hopefully will allow managers to direct efforts toward those other things that I posted on the screen that might be affecting Yosemite toad declines. Um, and this also contributes to the growing body of anti-predator behavior seen throughout, through my experiments. And we'd just like to thank these people, but I'd like to jump right into questions if anybody has any. Thanks. Yeah, I think that's true. Her question is the difference between um, the way beetles feed on tadpoles might affect whether, how they eat them versus the larvae in the adult stages. And I think that's true. I've definitely seen the, the larval form of predaceous diving beetle, the ditisid larvae, have piercing-like sucker parts, inject venom, suck out body fluids, and that's more, I see that more commonly in environments, um, in meadow environments where they are feeding on Yosemite toad tadpoles versus where I don't see the adult beetles doing that often. I just had access to adult beetles when I was doing my experiments, but I presume the adult beetles, from what I witnessed, had a very, the toads are very easy to catch. Tree frog tadpoles were not very easy to catch, but they preferred the tree frog tadpoles. But when they, in the instances where they did actually capture a Yosemite toad tadpole, they would flip it over on its stomach and start eating it from the belly side first, and then usually leave the tail and rest of the skin. So. Um, originally, my original conversations with, with Dave Martin were that he had observed in the wild trout pecking at eggs. Um, I have not observed that, but I did see some mortality in my eggs, but it was very low. I think five out of 150 eggs were, appear to be sampled by trout, but I did not witness it individually. But it's certainly suggested that it might happen, but I think it's very rare. No, I, I did not. I did go back um, this summer. I didn't get a chance in 2004 when I started my research. I did go back in 2005 with underwater camera equipment mm -hmm. to try to capture that, but that was a little too late for the egg stage to see that, so no. I don't think that trout have access 
the areas in which Yosemite toads lay is about six centimeters of water. It's about six to ten centimeters of water. So I don't think, and it's in the ephemeral bodies, it's probably harder for trout to get into, but in the lake margins, the areas in which they're doing it might be a little bit harder for larger trout, certainly, to reach, but probably not smaller trout. There might be gape limited for the smaller trout. I don't know. Thank you.